you tell the story of the world in under half an hour without bursting a blood vessel in the brain. Easy. You skip a lot, and you tell only the good parts. The boring bits are still there, don't worry, waiting to be discovered in dusty textbooks around the world. Speaking of the world, it was a pretty rough place for a long time. The animals were bigger and stronger, the environment deadlier, and the standardized tests weren't even multiple choice. At some point, man dropped into this cheerful scene, grotesque, hairy, and oh so easily dispatched by a woolly mammoth with a grudge. Not to worry, the story ends well for our smelly and hairy little ancestors. Turns out we have these neat things called opposable thumbs and a brain larger than a peanut. Combine the two and all of a sudden you've got a species capable of picking up a rock and throwing it, or sharpening a stick, or dare I say learning to start a fire to cook meat, domesticate animals, and even grow their own crops. That last, by the way, was important enough that historians call it the Neolithic Revolution, which seems an overly fancy name for humans learning how to farm. Before you know it, we were gathering around those fires, eating those crops, and using grunts and growls that were quickly becoming the first languages to describe this nifty new invention called the wheel. Once humans didn't have to worry about either hunting or gathering their food and were mobile, naturally they spread, formed settlements that became towns, that became cities, that became civilizations, and of course, someone had the bright idea that wheels could help us burn those civilizations down. An ancient Akkadian named Sargon is said to have been the dude who first conquered different civilizations and combined them into an empire. And even though he sounds like some kind of chemical you'd find stowed under your sink, he did his cleaning with horse-drawn chariots and a whole lot of death. Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, they all sound like villains off of Star Trek. But in reality, they're the names of ancient civilizations, many of which arose in one specific spot on Earth between two rivers in the Middle East, called the Tigris and the Euphrates. Today the area is called Iraq, but historians know it as Mesopotamia, the fertile crescent of land that was easily cultivated for farming. All around this funny little globe of ours, civilizations were forming around rivers, from the Yellow River in China to the Nile River in Egypt. Back in our land between two rivers, which is what Mesopotamia actually means, showing a literalist streak and a lack of imagination in our ancestors that's rather depressing, a king of Babylon named Hammurabi decided to set down some pretty precise do's and don'ts for his people. Hammurabi's code was the first real set of laws in our history, not to mention being fairly harsh, being the origin of the phrase, an eye for an eye. You couldn't accuse him of being soft on crime, could you? Cultures, religions, governments thrived along the river valleys of the world. By this point, the last ice age had ended, the ice had receded, and the nomads who had wandered across the Bering Land Bridge following game found themselves stranded on the American continents. Good news for them, because they would miss a lot of the really fun events like the Black Death and the Hundred Years War, not to mention the Crusades. Bad news for them, because they also missed out on the invention of gunpowder, and exposure and eventual immunity to common European diseases. So when the Eastern Hemisphere finally found them and their unspoiled continents, slaughter and slavery would kind of rule the day. But we get ahead of ourselves. It's hard to ignore the mark the ancient Egyptians put on this earth, mostly because so much of their cultural contribution is still hanging around like some kind of everlasting reminder that no matter how cool you are, your civilization never built something as insanely awesome as the pyramid. Really though, Western civilization owes a lot to the development of another region, across the Mediterranean Sea, a tiny spit of land called Greece, home to a people that like to fight and then sing about it. At some point, a bunch of Greeks decided to cross the Aegean Sea and stomp a mud hole into a city called Troy, maybe because a handsome Trojan prince had made off with a beautiful Greek queen, or maybe just because the Greeks were pretty grumpy most of the time. Either way, a blind Greek poet named Homer would take to singing about the war and its heroes, which led to an epic piece of adventure we call the Iliad and the Odyssey. Whether Homer made the whole thing up in a crazy fever dream after eating some bad olives, exaggerated actual events, or was he even blind at all, we'll just never know. Of course, the Greeks made things difficult for us in other ways, like by not being an actual country. The Greeks never really developed a sense of unity, and so were never in ancient times a single nation called Greece. Instead, each city developed its own laws and customs, 
There were a lot of these Greek city-states, most notably Athens and Sparta. Athens developed a culture that was largely influenced by more, shall we say, artistic sensibilities. I like to think of them as long-haired hippies of ancient Greece, running around in bathrobes or dancing in fields of flowers composing poetry. Athens is best known for developing the kind of government that would eventually come to dominate the world, democracy. In this first case, it was a direct democracy. All citizens voted on every issue, which got to be a huge pain in the neck. Don't believe me? Ask ten people what color to paint a toilet, red or blue, and you get at least a few people asking for chartreuse. Now try the same thing with 10,000. While Athenians could best be described as ancient liberal hippies, the Spartans could best be described as right-wing fascist baby killers, almost literally. Spartan society revolved around warfare to such an extent that male Spartans had no choice but to practice that profession. There were no Spartan shoemakers or farmers. Slaves, called helots, did all the other work of the city-state, leaving the male citizens free to train to do what they did best, killing in battle. You know, the problem with being a bunch of tiny villages and towns that really don't get along is that when a large empire decides to lump you together and take you down, it's kind of hard to get organized and defend yourself. Against all odds, the Greeks managed to do this twice. The big bad guy was the Persian Empire, which if you compare Greece to a single house, was about the size of four or five Death Stars. And yet the little guys won, not once but twice. After banding together against their better judgment and definitely against their natures to confront the Persian invasions at Marathon and Thermopylae, the Greek city-states celebrated by engaging in a 30-year-long struggle against each other. The Peloponnesian War left the Greeks depleted of manpower, resources, and anything resembling strength. The ultimate example of why we should all probably just get along. Into the void stepped a young man from a little country called Macedon, a man known as Alexander the Great which is a pretty big tip-off that he was kinda a big deal. He conquered Greece, then, just for good measure, marched into Persia and conquered them too. Apparently he lacked any kind of pause button, because he just kept going straight into India. It's a toss-up whether we call him great because he killed a good portion of the world's population, or because he was actually kinda tolerant of other religions and cultures. Regardless, he died at the young age of 33, which is kind of epic fail. If Alexander had just kept marching, he would have bumped into a guy in China named Shi Huangdi. This guy had finally managed to unite all the little Chinese empires into one country under his rule, something we call the Qin Dynasty, which is where China actually gets its name. Alexander would have had a tough time actually getting to this first emperor of China, though, because Shi Huangdi also ordered the construction on the first iteration of the Great Wall of China. Of course, everything rapidly fell apart after Shi Longdi's death, but maybe it helps ease the pain to know that the first emperor was supposedly buried in a crypt that was a perfect model of his world, complete with jewels lodged into the ceiling to represent stars, and rivers and oceans represented by flowing mercury. Back in the more familiar realms, a tiny city on the Italian peninsula was rising up to pretty much bully the known world. That city was Rome. And for a good long while, its system of republican government provided an inspiration for fledgling democracies everywhere. If, of course, the Roman legions weren't grinding those democracies, tyrannies, and, well, pretty much everyone else, into the dust under their boot heels. Then a guy named Gaius Julius Caesar came along, and the Romans lost that bit of coolness that being a republic brought them. Caesar was stabbed by a bunch of ill-tempered Romans before he could really complete his revamp of Roman society, but his nephew Augustus finished the Republic off for good and replaced it with the Roman Empire, ruled by a single man rather than a Senate. Voting? <laughs> Who needs it? We've got roads, aqueducts, and buildings that will last for over a thousand years, not to mention amazing fashion sense. It was during the 400 years or so of Roman imperial rule that the Mediterranean world saw the birth and death by crucifixion of a man who would rock history to its foundations, a carpenter in the Roman province of Judea named Jesus of Nazareth. The religion that rose around his teachings, known as Christianity, gradually gained followers and influence until the Roman emperor Constantine made it the official religion of the empire. It's amazing Constantine found the time to deal with religious matters, really, considering that the Roman Empire was going through what counselors would now call personal issues, and what I call a lot of messed up problems that are going to cause total collapse and the invasion of literally a metric ton of screaming barbarians.
At one point, Rome split into two empires, ruled by two emperors, one based at the city of Constantinople in modern-day Turkey, an old city named Byzantium that Constantine had modestly renamed after himself, and one in Rome. The Eastern Roman Empire, or Byzantine Empire, would last well into the medieval ages. But the Western Empire, based in Rome? No bueno. Apparently nothing lasts forever, and that includes the Roman Empire. A thousand years is a long time, but the clock on the Romans finally ran out around 476 AD. And suddenly, all the technology, law, and protection the Western world had enjoyed was gone. Poof. Adios. A lot of times we call the 500 or so years from the fall of the Roman Empire to around the turn of the first millennium, the Dark Ages, mostly because we can't see into it very well. Very few people wrote about their experiences in that time. Makes sense, since they were too busy trying to survive. When a screaming Viking comes running off a freaking boat wearing no clothes but swinging an axe larger than a small horse, yeah, sitting down to write about how you feel about that is pretty low on your priority list. Every which way you looked in 500 AD, there was some kind of mean folk with a battle axe ready to turn your head into a canoe. To the north of Europe, the Norsemen of Scandinavia, the Vikings, were using their fast and maneuverable longboats, the dragon ships of legend, to rape, pillage, burn, and yes, occasionally settle and farm throughout the northern world. This included stops in northern Asia, where they were known as the Rus, or the modern-day ancestors of the Russians, the Byzantine Empire, where they were bodyguards for the emperors, and even in North America, settling a Newfoundland long before Columbus sailed the ocean blue. They also had guys that fought naked after munching on mushrooms, but that's another story. Just because Europe was having a little crisis didn't mean the rest of the world was, however. In China, the Han Dynasty was reinforcing the Great Wall and basically functioning as the Far East version of the Roman Empire. In Arabia, an affluent trader named Muhammad claimed to have a vision from an archangel. His message, sharing so many elements with Christianity and Judaism, the three religions are together referred to as the people of the book, would become Islam. And unlike the slow spread of Christianity, it would spread across the Western world quickly, usually with the help of armies and swords. The spread of Islam finally clashed with Christian Europe in a violent way. A group of Muslim warriors known as the Moors conquered northern Africa and most of Spain. They set up a civilization that was pretty much the beacon of tolerance, science, learning, and art until Europeans collectively decided things were going way too well and there needed to be a bloodbath to take it all back. I guess someone had to make sense of this mess, and it turned out to be a bunch of barbarians that weren't so barbarous after all. The Franks, the ancestors of the modern day French, led by a guy named Clovis, conquered and held most of Central Europe. It was a Frank named Charles who finally kind of settled the entire European continent down. Based in Paris, his Holy Roman Empire, yet another Roman Empire, sorry, became a basis for many legends of the medieval ages, and he gained the nickname Charles the Great, Charles Magnus in Latin, or as history knows him, Charlemagne. At one point during the Dark Ages, two powerful leaders of the Christian Church started to argue over whom was more powerful, the Bishop of Rome or the Bishop of Constantinople. The argument got bigger, and they promptly excommunicated each other. Essentially, they kicked each other out of the Christian clubhouse. The Bishop of Rome began to call himself the Pope, and his followers would become what we call the Catholic Church. The Bishop of Constantinople began to call himself the Patriarch, and his followers would become what we call the Eastern Orthodox Church. We call this event the Great Schism, but it certainly wasn't the only violent occasion following the fall of the Roman Empire. Our American heritage is due to another totally bleak feast of death known as the Norman Conquest of 1066. The throne of Saxon England was vacant and three contenders wanted that chair. A Saxon, a Viking, and a guy from the French coast of Normandy with a boring name, William. William wound up with a crown and the cool nickname of the Conqueror, while his competitor got an arrow in the eye socket at the Battle of Hastings. Around this time, the Pope, known as Urban II, woke up one morning, as you do, and realized he had a problem. His problem was that his religion preached peace, and yet all European Christians seemed to do was try and kill each other. Christian Europe was a hornet's nest of people who really had an itch to put a sword in someone else's head. Then the Pope got a letter that solved everything. It was from the Byzantine Emperor, and it asked, quite politely, if the Pope could send a few mercenary knights his way to help him reclaim Byzantine territory taken by the Saracens, Muslim peoples in the Middle East. Instead, 
the Pope preached an armed pilgrimage to the Holy Lands around the city of Jerusalem, encouraging Christian Europe to journey to the Holy Land, free it from Muslim rule, and reap the spiritual rewards for saving God's city. Thousands upon thousands of Europeans, from nobles to peasants, walked, rode, and sailed to the Middle East. And a series of wars and battles that took place over possession of the Holy Land became known as the Crusades. After two centuries, the basic result of the Crusades was a lot of bloodshed, and the basic political and power structure of the Middle East remaining exactly as it was before Pope Urban ever got that note from Constantinople. Meanwhile, the Christian church was shaping the medieval world in other ways. Chances are that if a peasant had any kind of education at all, it came from a parish priest, presumably before they gave education of the young over to nuns, rulers. The first universities and colleges were founded by the church in order to educate the clerics and priests of the future. Certain segments of the religious community decided, for various reasons I'm sure sounded great at the time, but seemed pretty twisted in retrospect, that in order to avoid sin and grow closer to God, they had to isolate themselves from the world and from women in communities known as monasteries. These monks sometimes took extreme vows of celibacy, of poverty, even of fraternal silence. I guess all that free time had some positive benefits. Many of the classics of Greek and Roman literature and science have come down to us due to the monks hand-copying books page by page for decade after decade. With religion playing such a large role in day-to-day -day life, large enough to spur on 200 years of warfare in faraway lands, there arose an interesting conundrum. Who had ultimate say in a realm, the king or the pope? At times, an uneasy kind of truce kept church and state together. But at other times, kings just got a bit tired of being told what to do. You see, there was this thing called feudalism. It doesn't exist anymore, and it's a little tough to understand, since we are so used to thinking of people having loyalty to a country. In medieval Europe, loyalty was to a powerful nobleman instead. The idea of a country as we think of it didn't really exist. A country was simply what the rich and powerful could hold on to during their lifetimes. Feudalism is a pyramid, really, with the king on top. He would rent his land to rich men called vassals. A king and his vassals would make a deal. The king gave the land, the vassals promised him loyalty, an act called homage. At the bottom of the chain were the poorest of the poor, called serfs. They weren't slaves, not exactly, but they were tied to the land in which they had been born. No, they weren't literally tied down with ropes and chains, at least not until they made trouble, but they couldn't legally leave their lord's land to work somewhere else. It was, in essence, a kind of quasi-slavery, the Diet Coke of slavery, the margarine of slavery, the... well, you see where I'm going with this. Sometimes, though, kings could push things a little too far, and none pushed further and got totally slapped by karma more than England's King John. He was the brother of Richard the Lionheart, the famous English king who fought during the Third Crusade. Over the course of his reign, a combination of higher taxes, unsuccessful wars, and conflict with the Pope had made King John pretty unpopular with his barons. In 1215, some of the most important barons got fed up and decided to rebel. John had no more luck with fighting than he had with ruling, so it should come as no surprise that the barons gained the upper hand. They forced King John to agree to sign a document we know as Magna Carta, or the Great Charter. The Magna Carta basically said that a king's power was not arbitrary or unlimited, and that no free man could be punished except through the rule of law, not whim. Basically, stop messing with your people, you messed up runt of the Plantagenet litter, and start acting like a king who gives a flip. Somewhere around the 1300s, Europe underwent a last minor ice age. In other words, it got really, really cold. It was tough to farm, and the out-of-work farmers crowded into cities already super crowded. Few people bathed very often. There was no street cleaning or running water. It was basically a breeding ground for disease. They got a whopper. It was the bubonic plague, or the Black Death. It struck quickly, caused painful death from lung failure and giant pustulating sores, fun times, and killed over a quarter of Europeans, and millions worldwide. As if 200 years of failed warfare in the Holy Lands and a disease that involved exploding pustules weren't enough, I've got something else for you. A conflict that would be the crowning lassuckitude of the medieval ages. Two Christian kingdoms, 
bled by the Crusades, ravaged by the Black Death, got involved in a war that lasted 116 years. Perhaps because they weren't feeling very creative, or perhaps because they were just tired and a little fuzzy on the details after 116 years, Europeans called it the Hundred Years' War. Essentially, the Hundred Years' War was actually a series of wars, waged from 1337 to 1453 by two families, one English, one French, over which would sit on the French throne. Yes, you heard correctly, over a century of warfare over which of two families got to plump their rears on a fancy chair. In the end, the English royal family of Plantagenet would have to settle for just England, Scotland, and Ireland, and left France to the French. Then, just to put the icing on the cake, the Byzantine Empire and the city of Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks, and all of Europe had to start worrying about a major Islamic nation right on their doorstep, an empire that would last, incidentally, right up until the end of the First World War in 1918. No wonder the European kingdoms would start pulling themselves into a rebirth of the culture, art, and science of the Roman Empire, a renaissance of all the best things that have fallen by the wayside for a thousand years. Before the renaissance could take full flower, there was just one more pesky little problem riding hard out of Asia. The Mongols. Later generations would say that the end of the world was born in a primitive tent in the grasslands north of China, clutching a blood clot in his tiny infant fist, a sign of greatness, or of complete tyranny. He was named Timogen, but you know him better by his eventual title of Supreme Ruler, or in his own language, Genghis Khan. The Mongols under the Great Khan swept into China, conquered the crumbling and corrupt remnants of the Han Dynasty. With Chinese technology allied to Mongol courage and skill, the golden horde of Genghis Khan swept west over the Gobi Desert, aimed straight at the heart of the flourishing Islamic empires in Persia and the Middle East. Khan's descendants would conquer the largest land empire in world history, dwarfing the empires of Rome, Persia, and Alexander. The forces of his grandson, Kublai Khan, would see Mongol horsemen riding into Europe and threatening the cities of the Balkans and Italy. When a European traveler named Marco Polo followed the great Silk Road that led from the Western empires of the Byzantines and the Islamic Caliphates to China, he met Kublai Khan in his large palace of Zamadu. When Polo returned, he brought to Renaissance Europe the spices and culture of China, along with the stories of the Mongols. Culture really was the buzzword of the day during the Renaissance. Italian artists like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci were sculpting, painting, or inventing for rich patrons, including the popes of the Catholic Church, and explorers, driven by a need to find quicker ways to the east to bring back spices and silks, were setting out in ships to cross the ocean blue. That would include a sailor named Cristobal Colón, who in 1492 convinced Spain's King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella that a quick route to India could be found by sailing across the Atlantic Ocean. Provisioned with three tiny ships, this navigator would eventually bump into the two continents of the Americas, naming the peoples he found Indians, more out of wishful thinking than anything else. This sailor's name would come down to us not as Colón, but as Christopher Columbus. The civilizations he had stumbled onto were the descendants of those nomads who had crossed the Bering Land Bridge all those many millennia ago. And while the West had been crusading, creating, and destroying empires, and discovering that perhaps bathing regularly was a good idea, the Mesoamericans had been creating wonders of stone in the middle of the jungle. The great Mayan civilization in Central America was known for crafting stone cities and buildings that would have rivaled anything in Egypt or Rome. Grand temples and palaces rising out of the jungles at places like Chichen Itza. They also watched the stars, developed a highly sophisticated calendar, and yes, are responsible for that lovely prophecy that says the world should have ended in 2012. But they also practiced human sacrifice in the belief that they were supporting their gods. Apparently all that blood didn't help much, because the Mayans suddenly vanished the power of Mesoamerica. No one could be sure why, but at a certain point, the great stone cities were abandoned to the jungle for no apparent reason. Into the void stepped the Aztec, a warlike tribe who had built a magnificent city called Tenochtitlan in the middle of the Lake of Mexico. It was larger, more populated than Rome or Paris, and was a home to a people who took blood sacrifice to an extreme. It didn't take long for European explorers, 
Monks, soldiers, and merchants start cramming into little wooden ships to sail to the New World in search of, or because of, three things. God, glory, or gold. The most effective of these conquistadors was a Spaniard named Hernán Cortés, who conquered the mighty Aztec guile, guns, and germs. Meanwhile, other Native American civilizations, like the Inca, were being brought low in similar ways, and on the horizon was a new horror. Sugar. The Europeans had an enormous craving for sweets, a taste supplied by the growing of sugarcane. Sugarcane is, unfortunately, a fairly demanding plant when it comes to the room it needs in order to grow, and Europe was by this time incredibly crowded. The discovery of the New World was a godsend, for it portended miles and miles of land in which to grow this precious crop. Of course, the original workers of these massive plantations were captured Native Americans who succumbed to European disease so quickly that another source of labor had to be found. European eyes turned to Africa, where in return for gifts of European merchandise like guns and sugar, African chiefs sold some of their own people into slavery. These slaves were transported across the Atlantic in a horrible trip known as the Middle Passage. Once in the New World, slaves worked the plantations and produced raw materials which are sent back to Europe in exchange for gold. The flow of materials and men during the slave trade is known today as a triangular trade. It was about this time that the Catholic Church had a little meltdown that we know as the Protestant Reformation, which is a long and hard way to say, but a lot of Europeans start wondering if the Pope really could sell those tickets to heaven called indulgences, or if the whole thing was more or less a scam. Guys like Martin Luther and John Calvin started challenging some of the core beliefs of the Christian faith, basically telling the Pope to take his excommunications and papal bulls and shove them. Not that any of this was easy and involved handshakes and agreeing to disagree. Once again, wars would be fought over religion, with some monarchs, like England's King Henry VIII, basically taking advantage of the Pope's weakening hold on power to declare themselves supreme in their own lands. Henry was probably more interested in marrying and divorcing wives at a dizzying speed, something the church frowned on, and Henry and his heirs didn't exactly make the question of religion any easier for their subjects to decipher. His daughter, Queen Mary, was staunchly Catholic, and spent her short reign basically yelling at the top of her lungs that everything her father had ordered the Brits to do was nonsense. And to make sure and prove her point, she went ahead and had a lot of Protestant heads separated fairly violently and suddenly from Protestant shoulders. She might have had a wonderful personality and a loving smile, but once you get stuck with a nickname like Bloody Mary, history tends to regard you with a bit of a sideways glance. Her sister, Queen Elizabeth, swung things in Britain back towards the Protestant side, and even though she also had a habit of cutting off heads and throwing royal temper tantrums, she got the nickname of Gloriana, the Virgin Queen, and her reign was known as the Golden Age, which just goes to prove that history is fickle. I suppose it pays to have William Shakespeare alive and kicking and owing you fealty while he's writing his best stuff. A lot of times, the Protestant reformers wanted religion to be more hardcore, hence the Puritans who would swarm into the North American continent as colonists. Those early North American colonists were an interesting mix. Highly religious Puritans mingling alongside the skeptical products of the Age of Enlightenment, somehow coexisting in 13 British colonies that had all considered themselves, despite distance and temperament, to be British citizens and subject to the British monarch. This was a pretty awesome arrangement if you were a king. England had its own civil war once on precisely this subject. The Cavaliers of King Charles I took on the Roundheads, a group of Puritans opposing the whole idea that a king had his power of FedEx direct from God. In the end, the Roundheads won, King Charles was executed, and yet the people were once again left holding the short end of the stick. As the New England, came under the dictatorship of a former Roundhead general named Oliver Cromwell. The English would eventually bring in a new monarchy after Cromwell's death, a monarchy constrained by law, just as the Magna Carta intended. This was called the Glorious Revolution, and basically consisted of the English people inviting a foreign couple, William and Mary of Orange, to come be king and queen, as long as they followed the law and allowed the people a say in government.
The idea that a king could control absolutely everything in his kingdom and absolutely nothing could stop him was called absolutism, and it was practiced by monarchs for centuries to varying degrees. For instance, Louis XIV of France, known as the Sun King, was an absolutist monarch. In order to distract his nobles from interfering in affairs of state, he built an enormous palace, Versailles, and made it mandatory for the nobles to be in attendance. The catch was that Versailles was a honey trap, filled with the best cooks, most beautiful women, and the finest gambling on the continent. The idea was to keep the nobles so distracted that they wouldn't care what the king did or didn't do. Maybe it worked for the nobles, but the common people of most European nations and their colonies were getting fed up. In order to pay for a war against the French, the British King George III had levied a series of taxes on his American colonies. To the colonists, this was the height of tyranny, primarily because the ruling body of the British government, the Parliament, had absolutely no members from the 13 colonies. This taxation without representation really made us pretty angry, and a lot like Bruce Banner on a bad day, it turns out the British didn't want to see the Americans angry. King George III and his government had a huge superiority complex when it came to the colonists, basically viewing them as rough barbarians since their powdered wigs weren't as tall as wedding cakes. Misunderstanding piled on misunderstanding as hotheads on both continents locked horns. The American Revolution, when it came in 1775, would last for over seven years and result in the formation of the United States of America, a republic inspired by the Age of Enlightenment and reason. Not everyone was paying real close attention to the lessons of the American Revolution. Inspired by the American example, the people of France also rebelled against their king. And there the comparisons end. The French Revolution was marked by far more bloodshed than the American version. In this case, it was the poor and downtrodden, working off centuries of despair and disparity by rounding up the aristocracy and leveling the playing field with the guillotine. Whereas the Glorious Revolution ended the idea of absolutism in England, and the American Revolution ended the idea of absolutist rule in the colonies, the French Revolution would actually wind up having the opposite effect, a lot like the English Civil War. So much chaos resulted from the random and numerous beheadings that it was easy for a general named Napoleon Bonaparte to take over and become the so-called Emperor of France. Bonaparte kind of became the European boogeyman, routinely whooping up on everyone else until he took it into his French noggin that invading Russia in the middle of the winter was a great idea. When he and his army limped back into Europe after that great idea turned out to be a horrible idea in disguise, everyone and their dog teamed up to beat him in battle and send him off to the island of Elba like they were sending a misbehaving student to a corner to think about what he's done. Well, Napoleon thought a while, and while he was at it, he thought he might slip away from Elba, go to France, declare himself emperor again, see what would happen. Today we call that time the Hundred Days, but it boils down to everyone getting together again to gang up on the French at the Battle of Waterloo. This time the winner has exiled Napoleon to the island of St. Helena, way off in the Atlantic, where he would die of either stomach cancer or arsenic poisoning after a few lonely years. So where does that leave us? The United States was about to descend into chaos with the Civil War. Britain was settling down to become a world empire with colonies on every continent in the Eastern Hemisphere. And France, well, we could fill textbooks with the kajillion different governments the French had between the French Revolution and now. Let's just say that they were very confused for a very long time. And being a French king, emperor, or president, were all equally dangerous and equally to be avoided by anyone with no wish to be guillotined. Britain's push to empire was aided by its impressive navy, sure, but also because it was the home to a new revolution, a revolution of machines, money, steam, and class warfare, an industrial revolution that might read like the most boring bits of the most boring textbook ever, but was nevertheless important. The revolution spread to the United States, where the American Civil War spurred it on. Guns were needed and provided for in factories run by Samuel Colt, among others, with interchangeable parts instead of handcrafted pieces that could not easily be replaced. Railroads crossed the continent bearing troops and supplies to distant battlefields. The manufacture of steel supplied the building material for a new age. The gap between rich and poor grew, as did class hatred. Only tragedy led to reform. Disasters such as the sinking of the Titanic, where most of the wealthy survived and the poor did not or the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, where workers burned to death in a building with unsafe work conditions. 
Philosophers such as Karl Marx began to talk about the evils of capitalism, the drive for wealth, and the gap between the rich and the poor, and sought to replace the drive for wealth with the need to serve a classless society, a philosophy known as socialism. As the 19th century became the 20th, governments moved to balance the needs of workers and owners both, but a storm was coming that would catch everyone up in a maelstrom of death and destruction on a worldwide scale. At the time, we called it the Great War. Later on, when we decided we liked it so much we wanted to have another one, we called it World War I. In 1914, the nations of Europe, and eventually the United States, were drawn into a conflict that was prompted by the assassination of a single person, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, who was killed in Bosnia by a Serbian terrorist. The nations of the world all moved to support each other as declarations of war started raining down on European capitals. It's almost as if everyone were eager for the largest conflict the world had ever known. Nations got ready to fight an old school war, marching across open fields shoulder to shoulder with drums beating and flags waving. Too bad the weapons had changed. Machine guns, poison gas, airplanes, submarines, tanks, all of these meant that the best thing an army could do was dig a hole and stay in it which is exactly what happened. In late 1917, the United States entered the war, provoked by the sinking of the ocean liner Lusitania by a German U-boat or submarine, and a message by the German government sent to Mexico, the Zimmerman Telegram, offering an alliance against the United States. By 1918, the fresh American troops had made the difference. Germany surrendered, bringing the First World War to a close. If there's any real-world example of how when you win a war, you shouldn't be a total sore winner and humiliate the loser, it's got to be the aftermath of World War I. The Germans were made to sign the Treaty of Versailles and its accompanying war guilt clause. It's basically like a bully beating you, then making you sign a paper saying the beating was your fault, and then taking your lunch money. The entire old form of German government, run by a king-like figure known as the Kaiser, was overturned in favor of a democracy known as the Weimar Republic, which is a kind of funny name because honestly it just sounds hilarious. The German economy was already in a bad way because of the years of warfare. Now, with high taxation and the need to pay back millions and millions in debt, the economy plunged. The Weimar government responded by printing just more money, an astoundingly bad idea that caused inflation on a horrific scale. And then the global Great Depression hit, and if everything hadn't been totally mired in suck before, it certainly was by the late 20s. Meanwhile, World War I had pretty much trashed Western Russia and proved to be the straw that broke the Russian camel's back. See, Russia had dove into the First World War and, ill-equipped and led, quickly began suffering casualties that numbered millions. Some soldiers were even issued pitchforks instead of rifles. None of the Russian people had been particularly pleased with the leadership of the Russian king or czar, Nicholas II, or the fact that they were all basically medieval age-style serfs. Soviets, or councils of workers, began to form all across the country in support of workers' rights. Vladimir Lenin was one of the chief instigators of the socialist revolution that was coming. Conditions were so bad, and the gap between the nobility and the poor was so wide, that bloody revolution was almost unavoidable. When it came, it was led by Lenin and other members of the Soviets, who forced the Russians to pull out of the First World War, depose the Tsar and his family by machine-gunning them, and formed a new nation based on socialist principles. Russia gained a new name, the Soviet Union, a communist collective, led by Lenin and then his successor, Joseph Stalin, who was not the nicest guy ever. He was actually kind of paranoid and wound up sending millions of his own people to their deaths in prison camps known as gulags. Over in Asia, things were taking an interesting turn. China was crumbling into what would eventually be a communist government, but the tiny island nation of Japan had risen to fill the gap. And by risen, I mean bombed everyone within a thousand miles into oblivion. Japan had finally been forced to interact with the rest of the world when the ships of Commodore Perry from the good old United States had sailed into Tokyo Bay and demanded at gunpoint that the Japanese join in international trade. The Japanese reluctantly complied at first, but during the so-called Meiji period, they came to embrace the modern industrial age. They gained several advantageous things from international trade, including modern weapons and tactics, while keeping the sense of honor and the militaristic thinking that had always been hallmarks of the samurai. After the First World War, the Japanese government started to look out at the rest of the South Pacific like a starving man looking to the window of a steak and shake. Determined to stand tall among the nations of the world, Japan lacked only one thing, 
resources, especially fuel, to power their military machine. They decided to take it from nearby Korea and China. Of course, none of this went exactly unnoticed by the rest of the world. The United States instituted an embargo of materials Japan needed, specifically oil, and if it's one thing an army bent on world domination needs, it's gasoline to fuel their ships, tanks, and planes. Japan was not pleased. Neither were the people of Germany. The Treaty of Versailles and the Great Depression led to a nation where most Germans were poor and angry. It was a perfect environment for someone charismatic and more than a little angry themselves to step up and convince all the other angry Germans that maybe it was time for a change. A gifted demagogue and orator, Adolf Hitler, took control of a group of angry Germans, the National Socialists, or Nazis, and told the German people what they needed to hear. He also gave them someone to blame for their poverty, the Jews. Appointed, not elected, chancellor by the Weimar president, Hitler soon usurped the powers of the presidency and the war ministry, effectively becoming a dictator of a fascist Germany, the Fuhrer. Secretly, Hitler rebuilt the German war machine, and then systematically began to reconstruct the German Reich by annexing Austria, Czechoslovakia, and all the land lost to France. In September 1939, Hitler ordered the invasion of Poland, which fell in two weeks, crushed by the Nazi Blitzkrieg. The world finally tumbled into a second world war. Hitler, being the sneaky so-and-so that he was, struck a secret deal with Joseph Stalin to keep the Soviet Union from entering the war on the Allied side freeing the Nazis to turn their attention to France and Great Britain. France fell quickly, the Nazis marching through Paris, leaving nothing but the island of Great Britain to face wave after wave of the German onslaught alone. Forces were moving, however, in the Pacific, which would change everything. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese sneak attacked the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, sending most of the U.S. Pacific fleet to the bottom. They had decided that war with the United States was inevitable due to the oil embargo, and that a quick strike would serve them best. They were about as wrong as they could be. Hitler responded to his distant allies' attack on the U.S. by declaring war on the United States himself. A pretty stupid move, considering it wasn't something he had to do, and they had already bungled big time by sneak attacking the Soviet Union when he got bored trying to make Britain surrender. The end result for Hitler and his Nazi thugs was the largest invasion in human history, the D-Day landings, followed by a push to Berlin that, for Hitler, basically ended up with him dead in a ditch with his last few loyal Nazis pouring petrol over him and lighting a match so his body didn't fall into Soviet hands. Over in the Pacific, the Marines had island hopped almost to the Japanese mainland itself, but the dropping of the first two atomic bombs and the incineration of two Japanese cities Hiroshima and Nagasaki made the Japanese reconsider their whole no-surrender policy. Tragically, the end of World War II also revealed the horrors the Nazis inflicted on the Jewish population of Europe in a series of massacres, death camps, and killing fields known collectively as the Holocaust. The defining moments of the post-World War II era came as part of what we call the Cold War, a series of events that played out for 40 years, a deadly game between the two great superpowers of the world left standing after World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union. What would follow would be a contest for influence, a game to see which way the world would swing, communist or democratic. More, the game had one pretty big rule. No direct warfare between the Soviet Union and the United States, since both nations had enough nuclear weapons to guarantee the world's destruction hundreds of times over, and would result in all of us being turned to atoms bouncing around the stratosphere. Occasionally, the Cold War led to actual bullets and bombs flying, though these wars were never technically fought between the U.S. and USSR. The first of these conflicts occurred shortly after World War II, on the far-flung Korean Peninsula was between the Communist North Koreans, backed by Communist China, and the Democratic South Koreans, backed by the United States. The Korean War never officially ended. Today, the two countries are still technically at war, though a ceasefire has existed since 1951, and over 30,000 American troops are still stationed in South Korea, a relic of a conflict often known as the Forgotten War. Korea wasn't the only arena, either. In the Western Hemisphere, several countries were flirting with revolution and communism, especially the island of Cuba, which lies less than 90 miles from American shores, 
A revolutionary named Fidel Castro had overthrown the Cuban government and replaced it with a communist regime with himself at the head. Castro sought out military ties with the Soviet Union, causing a whole lot of worry in the United States about what a communist Cuba could mean to the balance of power. The Cold War came closest to heating up, and I'm talking about nuclear-style hot here, during 13 days in 1962 that we call the Cuban Missile Crisis. President John F. Kennedy and his cabinet learned in October of 1962 that the Soviet Union had snuck nuclear missiles into bases in Cuba. These missiles weren't operational yet, but they soon would be. For 13 days, American forces readied for war, Soviet ships with more missiles sailed for Cuba and refused to turn back, and school kids in small towns all over the U.S. practiced ducking under their desks in the event of a nuclear blast, since your typical school desk was made of something a lot tougher in the 1960s, apparently. Kennedy resisted the pleas from his military advisor to invade Cuba, and instead made a secret deal with Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. The USSR withdrew its missiles, and the U.S. pledged never to attempt another overthrow of Castro while also removing its missiles from the country of Turkey on the Soviet border. At the same time, Jewish survivors of the Holocaust had flooded into the Holy Lands around Jerusalem, and with the help of the United Nations had carved out a Jewish state called Israel. The native Arabs, known as Palestinians, objected pretty strongly, and several wars resulted with Muslim states in the Middle East, most significantly Egypt and Syria. It was JFK who first committed U.S. troops to a southeastern Asian country called Vietnam in an attempt to preserve South Vietnam for democracy. The war that erupted there during the administration of U.S. President Lyndon Baines Johnson would last a decade and cost the lives of tens of thousands of young Americans as they were drafted and sent to fight against the communist North Vietnamese and their guerrilla fighter allies, the Viet Cong. Like the Korean War, the Vietnam War would end up in a stalemate, a draw with a country divided in two between the ideologies of communism and democracy. Meanwhile, under the leadership of Chairman Mao, China had become a communist power in Asia, rivaling and in time eclipsing the Soviet Union. The USSR had been rotting ever since the Second World War, its people living in fear and starving, its production geared for war for so long that it couldn't adapt to anything else. A Soviet invasion of Afghanistan ended with a Soviet defeat at the hands of Afghan freedom fighters armed by the United States. The post-war Afghan policy of the United States would in some ways inspire the rise of radical Islamic terrorist organizations such as Al-Qaeda. If the Vietnam War soured Americans on conflict in faraway lands over political ideology, it didn't matter much. During the administration of U.S. President Ronald Reagan, the Soviet Union visibly weakened, led by Mikhail Gorbachev, who encouraged a policy of glasnost, or openness, with the West. It was too little, too late. The Berlin Wall came down. Germany unified in 1990 as a democratic country, and the Soviet Union itself disintegrated in several coups in 1991, bringing the Cold War to an end. It was replaced for a time with economic prosperity around the globe, a prosperity that was shattered on September 11, 2001, as terrorists flew hijacked airliners into the World Trade Center towers and the Pentagon. The world, not just the United States of America, was pulled into a new conflict a war without clear-cut bad guys or finish lines. This war on terror led to U.S.-led invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, and an uneasy status quo of fear that reigns to this day. Looking back, the history of the world can't easily be summed up in a few minutes of a video. Whatever you've seen is merely the tip of a giant iceberg of history that could sink a thousand Titanics. Do yourself a favor and dive into the waters of humanity's stories a little deeper. See what's waiting for you down there. In the meantime, pass a test. Watch a documentary, visit a museum, and just try to appreciate everything that has come before.